So Simon, Luke points out, is from Cyrene. And that is a, uh, that's North Africa, which today would be modern day Libya. It's probably about an 80 mile journey from Jerusalem. And so we learn from Mark's gospel that Simon has two sons, uh, Rufus and Alexander. Now the fact that they're mentioned in the Bible suggests to us that they're well known among the Christian community. In fact, uh, one of his sons, Rufus, is mentioned in Paul's letter to the Romans when he says of Rufus, he is chosen in the Lord. So that kind of gives us an, a picture of Simon uh, here. But I want you to focus on Jesus. Because Jesus is already in a weakened state. Um, he's already been beaten by the temple guards before he's ever brought before Pilate. So he's already standing before Pilate weakened and beaten. Pilate sends him to be scourged, which weakens him even further. Um, he's beaten within an inch of his life. The blood loss would have been significant. And so he's standing there weakened. You know, most people, I keep hearing a beeping sound. Most people didn't survive the beating of the Romans. So that, that's how severe that beating was. If you ever saw The Passion of Christ from Mel, by Mel Gibson, and so you know that scene where Jesus is tied to the post and beaten, well, that is a very accurate account of what happened to Jesus. Very accurate account. And so his back would have been laid bare, would have been raw. And so they take this crossbar, which probably weighed about 100 pounds. It wasn't the entire cross. It was the crossbar. And they would put it on his shoulders, and his hands would go over the bar. But in his weakened condition, it was too much for Jesus to bear. It would have been too heavy, too painful for him to take up. Many have said that's, that couldn't be the case because he's God. And as God, he can't be weak. Yes, he is God, but he's also man He's God in the flesh. He's man. And he felt every lash of that Roman whip. Jesus felt pain. He felt pain. He felt weakness. And you know what else he felt? He felt the rejection. And he felt the abandonment of the very people that he came to save. You know what kept him even standing that day was the fact that he loved you and I so much. Knowing that he had to go to the cross so that we could be saved. So Simon, who's in Jerusalem for the Passover, is forced to carry the cross. Now in that day, a Roman soldier could come up to you and say, you're going to carry my pack, my gear, and, and there's nothing you could do about it. You were obligated to carry it a mile. You know, when Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount, he said, if you're forced to carry a pack, if you're forced to carry a um, their pack for a mile, go two miles. Go the extra mile for them. But Simon's not asked to carry a Roman's pack, but he's asked to carry the cross. And he carries it to the place where Jesus is going to be put to death. And none of us like to think about the cross because it's, it represents punishment, represents death. Much like the electric chair today represents punishment and death. Jesus took our punishment, our sin, upon himself, and that day took our sin to the cross where it was put to death along with him. And he asked us every day to pick up our cross and follow him, which is a symbol of us putting our flesh to death by making sacrifices in our lives. And Paul tells us what that would look like. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the miracles of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We're to present our flesh every day as a sacrifice. Put it to death every day not allowing ourselves to be conformed to this world. So Simon carries the cross to Calvary. 
And if the story ended there, it wouldn't have had a lasting impact as it's had to this day, right? And, and we, the situation we would be in would be hopeless because we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins. It was the resurrection that had the greatest impact. Because he lives, we live. Because he died, we're to put our flesh to death every single day. And the greatest impact that we can have on anyone around us is to die to self and be the creation, that new creation in Christ that we have become when we give our heart to him. Look at verses 37 to 31, 27 rather, 31. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And they will begin to say, To the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Someone has an alarm that's going off that is getting extremely annoying. So as Simon is taking the cross of Jesus upon himself, women are mourning, they're lamenting, and they're wailing over what Jesus has endured, possibly even because of his visage, how marred it is, what he looks like. I mean, it had to look horrible to them. So Jesus turns to them and he gives them a prophetic warning. He says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Weep for your children. And that would have been strange for them to have Jesus tell them to pray for barrenness because that was actually a curse for the women of his day. It was a curse. It, it was grounds for a divorce if you couldn't bear a child. But Jesus had prophesied the very same thing as he crested over the hill of the Mount of Olives and saw Jerusalem. And he said, as he drew near the city, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. That prophecy would come to pass some 40 years later when the Roman general Titus entered Jerusalem and laid siege to it. That siege lasted for five months, and it got so bad inside the city that many people turned to cannibalism, including eating their children. Josephus records that close to one million men died and countless numbers of women and children were taken captive by the Romans. And Jesus had told the people that they had missed the only peace that they would know through the Messiah and that destruction would come upon them, and it did. And that was the near fulfillment of this prophecy, but I believe this prophecy also has a future fulfillment in the tribulation. Because Jesus told us in Matthew 24 that there would be a great tribulation that would come upon this entire world but would especially affect the Jewish people. Reading from Matthew 24, verses 17 through 21, Jesus said, Let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be so jesus is giving the world a warning a prophecy that there's a tribulation coming and it is coming and it's going to bring terrible destruction upon this earth and the people of this earth and that time that jesus is talking about the tribulation is found in the book of revelation you can read it the whole it's described in detail in the book of revelation this prophetic warning is for every person on this earth as Jesus lays out what's going to occur on this earth to all of those who continue to reject him as Savior. 
Paul wrote, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, those who continue to reject the gospel message. Jesus came the first time as a humble servant, but he was mocked. He was beaten. He was persecuted. He's rejected. He was crucified. The next time he comes, it's not going to be as a suffering servant. It's going to be as a conquering king. And with him will come a sword of judgment. Right now, we are in a season of grace. That season of grace began at Pentecost, but it's going to come to an end with the rapture of the church. And once that season of grace is over, judgment will come upon this earth. Listen, it is by grace that we are saved through faith, right? So this season of grace that we're in right now is going to come to an end. And Jesus warned us about that, just as he warned the people in his day. And sadly, the people of his day ignored that warning, and destruction came upon them. Do not ignore the warning that Jesus has given us, or his return will come upon you like a thief in the night. And Jesus tells them, for if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Green wood is alive, right? It's living. Dry wood is dead. And so he's saying, what would they, all those involved in his arrest and crucifixion, what would they do? What is going to happen on this earth when all of the dry wood, the dead wood, those dead in their trespasses and sin, and who have not given their life to Jesus Christ, what will happen to them? And the answer is the same today as it was in his day. Judgment is coming. In his day, God used the Romans to bring judgment upon his people. But the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon this Christ-rejecting world by the hand of God. There's still hope. There's still hope for this world. And that hope lies in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they, were cruci they crucified him, where they crucified him, and the criminals, and one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, this very scene that we're reading here in Luke this morning was prophesied of a thousand years before the events happened. Hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented, David wrote this, The dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. So they've reached Calvary, a place called the skull. And you can tell by the pictures you're looking at now on the screen why it's called the skull. There's a skull face in that rock, of that, the face of that rock of that hill sits on. When we visit Israel, this is one of our stops. We go and visit the place where Jesus was crucified. Right behind us is the garden tomb. You can actually see the garden tomb from where Jesus was crucified. You see the tomb where they laid Jesus in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So when they get to the top of Golgotha, which is skull in Aramaic, there they would find three crosses laying flat on the ground. And what they would do is they would lay the prisoners down on that cross, and they would secure them to the cross. And in Jesus' case, they used spikes. They drive spikes through his wrists and through his ankles. Once secure on the cross, they would then pull the cross up with ropes, and as it got close to the top, the bottom of that cross would slip down into the hole. It was at the base of the cross, and it would jar the person on that cross into the hole. So once again, his body racked with pain, in shock, he has to endure yet another attack upon his body. As he feels his tendons and ligaments tear against those spikes when that cross falls into that hole. You know, those hands that heal the sick, those hands that raised people from the dead, those hands that gave sight to the blind, 
that caused the lame to walk are now pinned to that cross. And the only thing he has left is prayer. And he prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, don't hold them responsible. They're ignorant as to what they're doing. They're deceived. And that prayer that he prayed that day on the cross was answered on the day of Pentecost. I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost. This is Peter preaching a sermon. This Jesus raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing, speaking of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for all your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord your God calls to, them, to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who had received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. In the very next chapter of, of Acts we read, And now, brothers, know that you acted in ignorance, as did all the rulers, but that God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. So Peter, echoing the words of Jesus, tells them that they were ignorant. They were ignorant of what they were doing, of whom they were crucifying. And he calls them to repentance for what was done. And they repented, and they were forgiven, and they were saved. And that day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. Jesus' prayer was answered on the day of Pentecost. And by the way, it's still happening today. People are still saved the exact same way. Repent of their sins. They are forgiven of their sins, and they are saved. Because, listen, we are all responsible for the sin that brought Jesus to the cross. And when we repent of our sin, when we ask for his forgiveness, we are forgiven because, as I said, it is by the grace of God that, we're, that we, it is by the grace of God through our faith that we are saved. And for all those struggling with forgiveness here this morning who believe that forgiveness is impossible because of what was done to you, we have that same power living inside of us to forgive just as Jesus did. Sin, listen, forgiveness may not be easy, but it's not impossible if you just yield to the Holy Spirit in your life. Verse 35. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. So Luke points out that the soldiers are mocking Jesus. The religious leaders are scoffing at him. Now, both of the thieves, were told in Mark's gospel, both of them are reviling Jesus. But they weren't the only ones present there that day at the foot of the cross. There was also the women who had been following him probably since day one. There was his mother, and it was the disciple John were there. And what we have at the foot of the cross is a picture of how the world perceived Jesus. There are those who mock him. There are those who mock him the ones who would tell them about the death of Jesus and why he died on the cross for their sins. 
There's the religious leaders who scoffed at him. And that word scoff means deride him or snare at him. In short, they're laughing at Jesus. They're, they're, they're dismissing him. They're looking at him with contempt. And listen, there's religious leaders to this day and others who still dismiss the word of God and treat Jesus with contempt. There were the women. There was his mother. There was John who faithfully followed him. And they all loved him and were brokenhearted to see what their sin and what our sin was doing to him. They continued to follow him and spread the message of the cross even after Jesus was taken up to heaven after the resurrection. And so this is a picture of the world that we live in even to this day. There's mockers, there's scoffers, and then there's the faithful. And what you need to ask yourself today is which one of those terms describes you best? But here's the thing. Jesus could have easily come down from that cross because there's no nail ever made on the face of the planet that could have held him there against his will. But listen, if he came off that cross to save himself, he could never have saved us. And saving us was first and foremost on his mind. He willingly endured that cross. He willingly endured that torture for us so that we could be saved because there is no other way. There's no other way. Verse 38. Actually, verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged riled at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence and condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This scene also was prophesied over 700 years before it actually happened. Isaiah wrote this, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So Isaiah writes, One, at death, at the death of Jesus, he would be counted or numbered among the sinners, meaning the two thieves, meaning Jesus is identified among the sinners. Jesus became one of us, human, without ceasing to be himself, God in the flesh. He became human without ceasing to be being God, and Jesus left heaven and lived the life of a man and died the death of a man so that he could sympathize with us. So that in our, even in our weaknesses, he can sympathize with us. Because he was tempted just as we are, yet he never sinned. Two, that he would bear the sin of many. Peter wrote, he himself bore our sin in his body on that tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. By his death on the cross, our sin has been put to death. And by his blood, our sins have been washed away. And number three, he would make intercession for us sinners. The author of Hebrews writes, Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7.25 Jesus is seated today at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us against the accusations of the accuser. Who's the accuser? devil satan as satan presents charges against us to the father he looks at god and he says hey your precious child did this today your precious child did that today i know how i would feel if somebody said that to me against one of my precious kids but jesus is right there right there and he says father they're innocent they're covered by my blood. They've been given my righteousness. They're innocent. So the charges made against us by Satan do not stand up in court because we have Jesus 
as our, etern- as our attorney. And so the Bible tells us that he came to bear our sin, that he intercedes for us, because, listen, we could never have done that on our own, ever. This was all part of God's plan, all part of his salvation of mankind. God left nothing to chance, even Calvary, even the three crosses, because there wasn't just one cross on that hill that day. There were three of them. Those three crosses illustrate a spiritual truth about salvation. Those three crosses represent the fate of all mankind. You see, in the cross in the middle was Jesus, who took the sin of all mankind upon himself. He took upon himself the sin of the world, but he had no sin in him. He's innocent. On one side of Jesus hung a thief who rejected him as Messiah. And when he died, he died with all the sin he had committed, not only in him, but on him, as he was guilty as charged. That man's death on the cross may have satisfied his debt for the crime that he committed, but it would never satisfy the wages of sin, which is eternal death. On the other side of Jesus hung the thief who asked to be remembered when Jesus went to heaven. He too is guilty of his sin, but he repents and he sought forgiveness. And so he died in faith and his faith was accounted to him as righteousness because it's by the grace that we are saved through our faith. There was nothing else that he did. He never attended a Torah class. He never attended a church or a Bible study. He never said the sinner's prayer. But through faith, In Jesus Christ, he repented and he was saved. Think about his words. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The disciples were arguing just days before of who was going to sit on his right and who was going to sit on his left, who was going to be exalted in the kingdom of heaven. And here's a guy condemned to death, having his sins forgiven, and he humbly asked to simply be remembered when Jesus reached his kingdom. Lord, just think of me when you get to your kingdom. Just think of me. However briefly, just think of me. How humble is that? I think sometimes we lose sight on where we came from. We were condemned to death for our sin. Guilty as charged, everyone in this room. But we were washed clean by his blood on the cross, forgiven by his grace, and restored by his sacrifice. And we're guaranteed our future resurrection because of his resurrection and acceptance into heaven and that should humble us it should never elevate us god used three crosses to show the world what salvation was all about that jesus had come to die on the cross and to put the sin sin of mankind to death on that cross with him so that no matter how far that you've strayed no matter what you've done no matter how long you've been a sinner if you confess the lord jesus you will be saved. And in the case of the one thief, he accepted the fact that he was guilty of sin. He was guilty as charged. He knew what his fate was. He knew what his fate should have been, and that was death. But because he acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior, he received God's grace. He got what he did not deserve. He deserved death. What he got was eternal life. Even though his body died that day, He lives for all eternity. We're going to see him when we go to heaven. You're going to get to talk to him because he's with Jesus today in paradise. And that paints a beautiful picture for us because it refers to the garden where Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. It's a personal invitation to walk with Jesus in the garden. The other thief represent a sad reality for many today. He didn't acknowledge his sin. He didn't accept Jesus as Messiah. And like many today who believe they're not guilty of any sin, and so they never acknowledge their sin, nor do they ever repent of it, because why would you repent of something that you didn't do? What does John say? If you say you're not a liar, you say you're not a sinner, rather, I gave you the answer already. You're a liar. (laughs) Some multiple choice test, wasn't it? But when you die like that, you die separated from God for all eternity. This is why there were three crosses on Calvary. They're a vivid illustration of God's 
plan of salvation for the world. To repent and turn from our sin and turn to Jesus or die in your sin and be separated from him for all eternity. It's your choice. It's always been our choice. The question for you this morning is, do you want forgiveness for your sin? Do you want the assurance of eternal life in Jesus Christ? You know, you'd think it would be a no-brainer. You'd think it would be an easy decision. But Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, many. And that word in the Greek means most. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. If you want to be among the few who enter the narrow gate, you must acknowledge Jesus as Lord, just as the thief did on the cross that day. You must ask for forgiveness of your sin and repent of that sin and turn to Jesus. And notice, Jesus says, if you choose that way, the narrow way, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. John said before, being a Christian is not for the faint of heart. People are going to mock you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to treat you with contempt. They may even persecute you. But the reward for enduring that is paradise. It's paradise. Where you're going to walk with Jesus in the garden forever. And if that's what you want with all your heart, it is as simple as ABC. A, admit that you're a sinner. Just as a thief on the cross did that day. I deserve, Lord, what's coming upon me. I deserve it. I committed that crime. I am guilty. There's not a person in this room that isn't guilty of sin. The Bible backs that up. There's none righteous, no, not one. For we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the first step is admitting that we're sinners. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That brings us to be. Believe. Believe in all your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, that he died for your sins, that he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Romans 10, verses 10 through 11 say, Who with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, for the scripture says, Whoever believes in me will not be put to shame. Do not regret it. You will never regret giving your heart to Jesus Christ. You must admit that you're a sinner and confess that you can't do this on your own, that you need Jesus. And that brings us to C. Call upon his name. Confess you can't do this on your own because, listen, you can't do this on your own. There's no way you could save yourself. There's no way. And if you want to stand before the Lord and you want to take the punishment for those sins, that's eternal death. That's eternal separation. There's no bargaining here. You don't go with an attorney. You go guilty as charged. All you're standing there for is your sentencing. Without Jesus, it is hopeless. You remain dead in your trespasses and sin. It's as if it ended there on Calvary. And I can guarantee you that that will have an enormous impact on your life when you're standing before the judge at the great white throne judgment. There's only one way to be saved. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no one, no matter how powerful, no matter how strong, no matter how how weak or poor, it doesn't matter. Man, woman, doesn't matter. No one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will what? Be saved. Be saved. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So call upon the name of the Lord Jesus today. Confess you can't do this on your own. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And you will be saved. Please stand.